Welcome to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft, the founder and CEO of Judith Heft & Associates, financial and lifestyle concierge. This year, she's celebrating 27 years in business. In every episode, Judy interviews professionals who help others successfully manage their financial lives. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Judy is the author of two books, How to Be Smart, Successful, and Organized with Your Money for a Better Today and Tomorrow, and her latest book, Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles, how to successfully manage money in every decade of life. You can read chapters of her books and catch prior episodes of the show at www.judithheft.com. Now, here's the host of Mastering Your Financial Life, Judy Heft. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. This is our 70th issue of Mastering Your Financial Life. And today I'm really thrilled to be here with Jen Cochran. I've known Jen for so long. I watched her career soar. She started at the Federal Reserve many years ago, and she's had she's been the CEO and founder of the Gifted Travel Network for almost 11 years. And she just, you know, she's just learned so much over the years of being a great entrepreneur. She's had a lot of great experience, and now she has this wonderful business helping travel agents all over the world and, you know, just help them just really catapult their careers and help people. And, you know, I think I want to talk to you about this a little bit, Jen, because it seemed to me like years ago, maybe like 10, 15 years ago, it felt like the travel agency wasn't what it used to be, the travel business, because people were just booking online. But I think there's been a surge these last few years. I'm not sure how many years, and it's a lot different now. And travel agents are really helpful and you're really if you're planning a big trip, it's really great to have someone on your side. So I know that you're, you know, do you want to just talk a little bit about yourself too, if I left anything off there? Sure. No, I think you summarized that pretty well. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, you can have a really successful travel advisory business now. And I think the difference is that it's an advisory business. I mean, way back in the day, it was more of a transactional business. If you wanted a ticket or something, you had to go to a travel agent and they were basically, you know, just executing the things that you needed to do um, for a trip. But now, you know, there's so much information out there. It's almost information overwhelm and all. And so if you go to a travel advisor, they can help you. They've been everywhere. They've got access to resources that you don't have. And they can plan a trip that you can't plan on your own. I mean, it's like you, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't, you know, most things that you want done while you go to a professional and it's really no different. Your investment in your travel is a lot. It's typically a lot of money, right? So you want to be able to have a really good experience with it. So I always go to a travel advisor for my personal travel. I never do any of my own planning because I don't know what I don't know, you know? And, exactly. Um, yeah, it's so much better. I know I use a travel agent too, someone who I referred to you and Lainey is terrific. And, you know, I think with a travel agents, they get a lot of perks. Yeah. You know, they really, you know, at an advisor, they really help you. They'll get you like, you know, free breakfast or they get you an upgrade and things that you don't know to ask for. If you ask for them, you don't necessarily get them on your own. So it's really no, helpful. You wouldn't get them on your own because we have connections and relationships mm -hmm. that we've built over years that, you know, aren't they just aren't available to the consumer. Directly. And I think a lot of people might be thinking it's going to cost me more, but it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's helpful. So, you know, you're, you have a financially successful business. So how do you know, you know, when it's time to spend money in your business? How do you know how much to invest or what should you hold back on? And I think that over the years, you've experienced a lot of growth in your business, like I have too. And it's just, you know, one of the things I learned, I don't know if you feel the same way is like one of my coaches told me, it's like that Wayne Gretzky thing, you know, uh, look where the puck is going to be, not where it is right. now. And that's how I've been growing my business. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I always tell as I'm coaching, you know, advisors with their businesses and stuff that they need to hire a head of growth. It's the same idea because if you wait until you're at like beyond capacity and you're so busy just trying to keep all the balls in the air and everything, then you're you're coming first of all from a place of desperation as you're trying to get the help that you need, but also you're completely depleted, which isn't the best way to go about it. And you don't have the time to be able to do it right. And so it puts, 
basically you're putting capacity constraint on your business that shouldn't be there. So it's going to slow the growth of your business. Whereas if you know that your business is growing and you're starting to reach capacity and you hire ahead of that, then it frees you up to be focusing on the strategic things that's going to grow your business more and you can get the help that you need. And I think that's true with anything infrastructure, but people mostly. No, I, I agree too. And also, you know, it helped me when I was moving into a new office, there was a space I wanted that was really much bigger than I needed. And I decided yeah. to take it anyway. And I sublet one of the offices with the intention of growing into it in a year or two. And I did. And, you know, because yeah. so I already had the space, I was able to add more team members that way. So yeah, yeah it's, I, I see that you've done the same thing and I admire that. And, you know, it's great. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you don't know. Yeah, so, we yeah. did do that. We just actually added, so in our in our space that we have, we have an open area in the middle of the office, which is great because it's kind of, you know, collaborative open workspace. And we have sort of pods of desks and we just added another one because we've been hiring too. But the, the plan was to at least be able to be in the space that we're in for five years. That's great. Yeah, it's, a, it's always good to plan ahead. I think a lot, you have to be a little bit of a risk taker to be an entrepreneur, I think. Absolutely. You have to be a risk taker. And I actually, that's one of the things that I think is one of the adjustments and mindset for people when they shift from, you know, working in a corporate job to being an entrepreneur is that they're so used to, you know, having not just security and resources, but also the ability to sort of cross every T and dot every I before they move forward. And when you're an entrepreneur, you kind of got to build the plane as you're flying it. And so it's it's taking that leap of faith and just moving forward, even though you're not ready. And and we find that sometimes people get perfection paralysis, right? And so they, they're just, they, they oh, I'm not ready because my brand's not perfect or my website's not perfect or well, not all my marketing materials are done or I don't know this about this destination or whatever, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You just need to move forward and start um, working with clients and putting yourself out there. Oh, it's so true. I love that you have the same philosophy too. It's interesting how we ended up thinking the same way, only we went our yeah. separate ways. So that's yeah. great. Good to know. Great yeah. minds think alike. Exactly. So why do you think it's important for businesses to invest in, you know, services and technology and all these new apps and things that are out there and just to continue with growth? Yeah, it's efficiencies. I mean, certainly there's efficiencies in a lot of technology, but also those things affect our customer care and client service as well. And so that's really important because I think most of us in our businesses, you know, excellent service is one of the things that we value you know, to provide to our clients. And it's hard to do that if you don't have everything buttoned up correctly, if you don't have a consistent client care experience, if you don't have the ability to provide your clients with access to tools that make their lives easier, all that kind of stuff. So um, it's important. And in the travel industry, it's actually been a challenge because the travel industry has historically been very technical, technologically challenged because it was an industry that didn't have, you know, had people who were kind of set in their ways for a long period of time. And so they rejected new technology. And now it's, as you said, completely changed and has a completely diff de different demographic. And so now we're finally getting some really cutting edge technology to support uh, travel, which is, which is good. It's expensive, but it's really good. <laughs> So, you know, I know that you, we talked, I mentioned quickly that, you know, the client does not pay the advisor. How do the advisors get paid? Well, the client does pay the advisor. So there's two oh. aspects to it. I mean, the client pays the advisor essentially a, a design fee or professional fee for creating the whole experience because they're going to customize every single itinerary, every single experience to that client. Um, and then in addition to that, advisors are paid because we have preferred partner relationships with different partners. And so if you think about some of some of the you know sort of travel suppliers, they only work through travel advisors. So travel advisors are essentially their sales distribution. Mm -hmm. And even ones that have direct to consumer, they rely very strongly on the travel advisor community to help them build loyalty with clients and everything else. So when travel advisors refer clients and business to those companies, then they reward those travel advisors with uh, commission payments. That's interesting. Because, so because otherwise they'd have to go out and attract that client themselves. Right. So how did your experience at the Federal Reserve train you and help you and guide you to become an entrepreneur? Because that's so well, corporate. Yeah, I know. It's interesting. But I was sort of, I was sort of kind of like a startup 
turnaround type person within the Federal Reserve. So like whatever the thing that was broken or whatever the crisis du jour was or whatever the new thing was that needed to be implemented or whatever, you know, wherever there was like a problem blowing up, I would kind of like go in, I'd figure it out. I'd get the right team in place, set the strategy, get it up and running. And, you know, that typically take me like two years and then I'd like move on to the next crisis or problem or new thing or whatever. And so that so starting things, even though it wasn't an entrepreneurial setting, was something I got really comfortable with. And I'm a really fast processor. So for me to kind of come in, see a problem, figure out how to address that problem, that's the way my brain works. So doing it in a in a startup setting where it was my own business felt sort of natural. The difference was not having access to a technology department, an IT department, a legal department, like all of those things that you don't have access to when you're an entrepreneur and figuring all that out. Um, you know, my first entrepreneurial business actually I had a little community based business that I started and sold. And that was, you know, the first time that I had to like put together a website and an autoresponder system and, you know, all that kind of stuff that I hadn't had to do in my professional career. But it's fun figuring that stuff out. Oh, absolutely. I love doing that, too. And of course, you know, I came from a retail background, pre computers, pre websites, right. pre everything. I'm dating myself, but still. And then yeah. I had to really learn all of that stuff, too. And it was just a little bit a little daunting to some of it. Sometimes like, oh, my goodness, I don't know how to do this. But I learned and I hired the right people. Right. Uh, really yeah. good tech support and good finance mm -hmm. people helping me, good accountants, attorneys. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to learn how to delegate, too, as an entrepreneur. It's really important to understand that you can't just do everything yourself. And, you know, one of the things I really like that you said is that you hire good people, including finance people, because clearly you have an expertise in that area. But that doesn't mean and, and so do I. But I'm not doing my own books and records. I have an employee doing that because that's not my highest and best use as CEO of the company. And that's another thing that's important, I think, for entrepreneurs to recognize is just because you can do all of these things, you shouldn't be doing all these things. I mean, you need to have enough familiarity to direct the strategy. Right. But if you're sitting there, you know, entering you're downloading your credit card statement into your QuickBooks account or something, you're not out building your business. You're not out working with clients. You're not thinking strategically. You're doing what is essentially support work for your business. So the first thing that I tell people to do is stop doing anything that is not driving the growth of your business. That's where you need to bring in additional help. I think it's really hard for some people to learn how to delegate. Yes, absolutely. Really is. They think, well, I'll just do it myself. It's easier or quicker. Why should I train anybody? But mm -hmm. delegating is really important because we, like you said, we shouldn't be wasting our time doing, I don't do my own books in my company and we have a bookkeeping mm -hmm. business and I'm not an accountant. So I have right. a great accountant and I'm not a lawyer. So I have a great lawyer and I don't understand mm -hmm. tech support. So I have great tech people and they, yeah. they make me look good. Everybody, yeah. you know, on my team, my CFO, my operations manager, make me look good. And, you know, that's that's what you need to do. And I think there's a little fear in there for some people sometimes. Yes, absolutely. I hear that all the time. People th don't think that the people can do it as well as them. And they feel like they're going to have to look over their shoulder all the time. And and, you know, some of that is they just need to get their feet wet. And once they kind of get go through the process of hiring their first person, they get more comfortable with it. But also I feel like then they have a self-sabotaging behavior because first of all, if you don't believe you can find the right person, you can't just right. because you, you have to, you have Mindset. to energetically put it out there, what you expect and to expect the right thing. But also if you expect to micromanage somebody, you're not going to get the right person because the strongest people don't want to be micromanaged. So that's, that's a good point. It's true. You have to hire people who have who want autonomy, which means you got to give them autonomy or you're not going to have good people. And that's hard for so many entrepreneurs. It really is in the beginning, especially in the beginning, until you realize yeah. that it's easier. They think it's hard, but it really is easier, I guess. Yeah, it's it's, it's once you get somebody trained and and smart people can train themselves, too. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is another sort of correct perfection paralysis thing that I find with entrepreneurs when they're building their businesses is they're like, well, I don't have policies and procedures in place. I sort of have a process, but I haven't documented it. So it's going to be really hard for me to train somebody. And I'm like, well, why don't you just bring the person in and they can document it all and build all of that out for you. You don't have to do it first. They can do it as they learn it. And so it's not, it's just a reframe of some of the problems that they see when they're sort of resisting bringing in help. It's so true. When I was you know, told by my coach that I have to have an operations manual and have policies and procedures like, oh, my goodness, everything was in my head. And then she said, which I did, you know, hire someone to do that for you. I'm like, oh, OK. And then we talked about it and I told him what I wanted and he just created the whole thing for me. And it was so much easier than me trying to 
re, it's not reinventing the wheel, but it's just trying to figure out something that wasn't my unique brilliance. That's right. not what I, you know, my expertise is in. So that's great to know. So let's take a little break here and then we're going to come back and we're here with Jen Cochran and we're going to talk some more about business and finance. Hey there. I just want to tell you a little bit about my new book that just came out called Mastering Your Financial Life Cycles. And here it is. It's how to successfully manage your money in every decade of life. I co-authored this with my CFO, Liz Levy. And together we created this manual that's going to help you through every stage of life. We talk about having a baby. We talk about young adulthood, pre-retirement, what to do when you're at that age of retirement, if you're contemplating divorce, do you need an estate plan? We cover all of these, each subject in a different chapter. And I really think that you're gonna find this so helpful because at the end of every chapter, we have checklists that you can look at and you can use and they can be a guide for you. So this is a wonderful manual that we've created. It's available on Amazon. You can also find it on our website at judithhep.com slash book. And we're here for you. If you need anything, reach out. I hope you enjoy the book. Here's another picture of it, just so you know what's going on. Here it is. And I'm really proud of it. It's my second book. And I'd love to have you uh, read it and give me your feedback. Judy Heft, judithheft.com, financial and lifestyle concierge, celebrating 26 years in business. And over the years, I've learned so much. And what I've been trying to do is impart a little bit of this knowledge to you so I can help all of you become as financially organized as I am. And we're back. We're back with Jen Cochran, CEO of the Gifted Travel Network. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about learning how to delegate and, you know, hiring the right people. But, you know, I think there's some things, you know, like there's different personalities and, and how do you incorporate that and get people to be on the same page when they come from different walks of life and different mindsets? How do you do handle that? Well, it, within our own team, actually, we focus a lot on that because, you know, you said something about like what your brilliance is. And so we we try and help our employees, you know, sort of identify what their brilliance is and help align their job responsibilities to areas of their brilliance, but also to appreciate how each other's different. So we use something internally called predictive index, but basically it's one of those things that kind of categorize people according to their work styles and preferences and stuff. And then we talk about, you know, how those are different or like at our last sort of strategy meeting with the team, we talked about energy types because you're right, people are different and people to bring different perspectives. And sometimes you have to understand that somebody, one person's a fast process somebody else is a slow processor some people need to think out loud some people need to you know time to process and so um i feel like it's not like a one size fits all in terms of what's going to make the optimal work environment or pace for each individual employee but we need them all to be able to contribute you know because we we lose something if we don't hear each individual voice. The whole reason we have all those different types of people working for us is because they all bring different perspectives and you need somebody who's really process oriented and you need somebody who's really idea oriented, you know, or we're not going to grow as fast. So um, it's it takes time to focus on that, I feel like, but it's really important in order for people to understand each other and see and, and how we all work differently. You have a great grasp on that. It's really cool to hear that. So, you know, what are some of the steps necessary? Like if someone, you know, to change from a mass mutual mass market travel agency to a really exclusive luxury travel company, how does that all work? Well, um, part of it is being aligned with the right resources. So for example, like our agency, we're part of the Virtuoso Consortia, which is the premier luxury travel consortia, which means that we have access to, you know, the right kinds of preferred partners. We've also um, are in all the hotel elite programs, which are very exclusive, very hard to get into. So if you want to be a luxury travel advisor and you want to be able to offer your clients like amenities at the Four Seasons and things like that, you need to be aligned with the right sort of partners. And that's almost impossible to do as an independent agency. You need to be with a host agency like we are that's aligned with the right consortia in order to get all those different benefits. Um, so that's important. And the other thing is understanding, you know, back to, it's almost like you have to go back to marketing fundamentals. What's your message? Who's your target audience? 
what do they like? Where do they hang out? How do you reach them? What are their pain points? You know, how do you speak to them in a way that's going to resonate for them, you know, in terms of the types of travel experiences that they want to have and, and, you know, and so that you can align your services and how you design travel to the clients that are, want that type of travel who are going to benefit from that type of travel. So companies that are going from a mass market perspective to a luxury perspective often have to tweak their messaging and rebrand to make it more aligned with the luxury consumer, for sure. Um, and then they need to also realign how they're getting in front of those clients. So their list is building techniques and, you know, and the type of content that they're putting out and everything so that it resonates with those clients. And then it's also hard for people that are accustomed to taking whatever business comes to them to being more selective about the business that they take, which is important if you want to have a successful luxury travel business. And so that's another mindset shift is that it's okay to say no to business and actually it's going to help you because you have to sort of release things, you know, the, the lower hanging fruit in order to attract mm -hmm. the the things that you want. Uh, so it takes like, like other things, it takes some guts to make a, a shift like that. But we've seen a lot of people do it really, really successfully and actually pretty quickly. It's hard if to it, say no to business. You really yes. have to be strict with your own values, I think, too, to turn stuff down. You have to really, because in the beginning, when you start a business, you say yes to everything. You'll do everything. Right. Even if it's not in your wheelhouse, you'll do it. And just because you want to build up your business and you need to do it for many reasons. And then after you become a little more successful, you're in that you're still in that mindset of saying yes to everybody. And it's really hard to learn how to say no to turn stuff away. That's really not in your best interest. Yeah, so, but it's so um, important because every minute that you spend with sort of business that's not perfectly aligned to what you're trying to do strategically is a minute that you're not spending building the business that you want to have. Yeah, that's so true. That's really helpful. So how many um, advisors, I keep saying agents, how many advisors do you have and how often do you work with your, these people to train them? So we have, we have, I don't know, 356, upwards of 350 advisors that are part of our network. However, the, we have fewer agencies because some of our agency owners have multiple people that are working for them. They have teams, they have employees, they have independent contractors that are working with them. So we have um, a smaller number of agencies. We're not so interested actually in, we like having that sort of number. We're not exactly working to like build the number of agencies. What we're trying to do is help the ones that we're working with be more successful. And so we do that in, in it like along the whole spectrum of where they are in their business. So we actually have a program called the Travel MBA program that's for people who are transitioning from other careers that want to start a travel business. And we teach them everything that they need to know about how to build their brand and, and you know, all of that and understanding the revenue dynamics and everything associated with the travel business, as well as how to actually do travel. Um, and so that's a 12 month program and that's been super successful. The people that have gone through that program with all different kinds of backgrounds, some of them have finance backgrounds, some of them have medical backgrounds, you know, all different kinds of backgrounds have done really well in that program. But once you've built the foundation, you're sort of not done, right? We're always growing as business owners. So then we have a group coaching program for people who are sort of in the, you know, the growth trajectory. And then for our top producers, we have a mastermind program. So at every stage of business, there's some sort of coaching and it differs depending on where the people are in their, in, in their business trajectory. So, so that we're getting the, the right kind of help and having the right kind of conversations about best practices. Cause you know, somebody who's building and managing a team has different challenges than somebody who's just building their brand to start with. That's yeah. There's so many things to think about. That's so helpful. Yeah. That's great that you have these. Di <clears throat> excuse me, different programs at different levels for people because that way you mm -hmm. can help so many people. So, what do you think are some of the key ingredients to being a successful travel advisor? Um, absolutely, some agility. <laughs> Having some agility and some patience is really important. And I think, but I think the most important thing is passion. The people that we see that have, you know, really built amazing businesses, they're just so passionate about what they do. And they generally get a lot of fulfillment and excitement about being able to help their clients and send them to amazing places all around the world and help them build memories. And then operationalizing that, you know, sometimes is the part that they need help with, but they can figure that part out. But if you don't start with the passion in anything, I think, um, 
if you if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like sort of drained and depleted, then you start resenting your clients and it just feels like heavy lifting. I think it's true with anything else. So if you really love travel and you really love helping people and you like the design, I mean, people who are in travel really need to be curious about different destinations, about people and what interests them, about different cultures um, in order to be able to design really great itineraries. So um for that sort of person, it's a really, it's a really phenomenal career. That, that sounds great. Maybe that's going to be my next career. I love to travel, but and I know the yeah, business a little you'd bit. You'd be amazing so. at it. <laughs> All right, I'll think about that. My next uh, after my swan song here, <laughs> maybe that'll be my swan song. <laughs> but anyway, this was so great talking to you, Jen. I really enjoyed it. Now, how can our listeners find you? Um, well, our website is www.giftedtravelnetwork.com. And there's information in there about our training programs for people who might be interested in starting a career in travel and um, yeah, just reach out to us. And they can probably find you on LinkedIn, I would think. Yes, we, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Instagram, all those, all those places. All right, great. Well, this was great. Well, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to see how you've grown over the years and evolved into this amazing businesswoman. I'm really proud to know you. I'm proud that I knew you way back when. Yeah, Thank my you. first real official job. Absolutely. And the only one I would ever, before that, it was official. The only one that I ever let babysit for my babies when you were, what, 16? Yeah. And they were one well, month old. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Well, it was, it was great. It was so great to have you. I was texting with uh, my daughter this morning I, with Willa, and I said, I'm interviewing Jen on my podcast. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to Mastering Your Financial Life, hosted by Judy Heft. You can read chapters of her books and catch prior episodes of the show at www.judithheft.com. Thank you for your positive comments and sharing this show with others.